Hi everyone, it's Miss Morogi here, ready to read to you from Jerry Spinelli's Maniac McGee. Now before we read, I want to go over our skill for the day. And today I want us to focus on what it means to visualize when we read. Now when you visualize, that's when you create a picture in your mind using the clues and the words from the story as you read it. Now, why do we visualize? As readers, when we visualize, it helps us get excited about what we're reading and helps us better understand the story. And it also helps us to make predictions or inference in regards to the characters or what may happen next um, based on your own previous knowledge and the information provided to you. Today, we're going to listen to chapters 33 to 36, and these are some of the vocabulary words that I want you to look out for. The first word is endure, and to endure means to tolerate. Next, we've got beseeched, and to beseech means to implore urgently. Next, we've got lambasting, which is to beat or to whip severely. And lastly, we've got carry on. And carry on is dead or rottenness, anything vile. So those are our words for the day. Now, yesterday's reading got me pretty emotional because Jeffrey experienced another loss. And at this time, it was the loss of a very close, another close person in his life. And it was the death of Grayson which was really heartbreaking for him to go through. And even as the reader, I got emotional listening to it because Grayson and Jeffrey had developed a really strong friendship. Um, and Jeffrey was admiring Grayson based on his career at, in the minor league. And he was asking him so many questions. He saw him as a family member because they served their uh, first Christmas together. So it was really heartbreaking reading the tragedy that took place when Grayson died in his sleep. And uh, we noticed that Jeffrey ran away. He didn't even stay for the whole funeral. It was just too hard for him. And that's something Jeffrey, that's one of the ways he deals with pain and sometimes he just runs. And... Um, I still am thinking about, hey, when is the next time he's going to see the Beale family or if he's going to see the Beale family again. And I'm hoping he does. So let's dive right back in on, in, on chapter 33. And let's see where Jeffrey goes to next. So chapter 33. January of that year was too cold and dry for snow. It was a month of frozen hardness, of ice. Maniac drifted from hour to hour, day to day. Alone with his memories, a stunned and solitary wanderer. He ate only to keep from starving, warmed his body only enough to keep it from freezing to death, ran only because there was no reason to stop. Even if the superintendent had allowed it, he could not have brought himself to stay at the band shell. He returned only long enough to pick up a few things, a blanket, some perishable food, the glove, and as many books as he could squeeze into the old black satchel that had hauled Grayson's belongings around the minor leagues. Before he left for good, he got some paint and angrily brushed over the 101 on the door. During the days, he ran, usually a slow jog, but sometimes he would suddenly splint, sprint, furious, 10 or 20 second burst as though trying to leave himself behind. Sometimes he walked, he crossed and recrossed the river. He wandered in all directions through all the surrounding communities and townships, Bridgeport, East Norton, West Norton, Jeffersonville, Plymouth, Worcester. Whenever he crossed the bridge over to Schoolkill, he turned his eyes so as not to see the nearby P&W trestle. Even so, in his mind's eye, he saw the red and yellow trolley from the high track plunging to the water, 
killing his parents over and over. After a while, he stopped crossing the bridge. Over than that, he went whenever, other than that, he went wherever there was room to go forward. Along roads and alleys and railroads, tracks, across fields and cemeteries and golf courses, from high above, a tracing of his routes would have looked as hopelessly tangled as cobbler's knot. By nightfall, he was back in two mills. He would retrieve the satchel from wherever he had stashed it and find a place to endure the night. A few times, he visited the buffalo pen where he covered himself with a second blanket of straw. Other times, his overnight quarters might be an abandoned car, an empty garage, a basement stairwell. When his original supply of food ran out, he fed himself at the zoo or at the soup kitchen down at the Salvation Army. He did odd, odd jobs for housewives, ran errands for shopkeepers. He would not beg. One day he found himself among monuments and cannon in Roland Hills. He was in Valley Forge. Here the Continental Army had suffered through a winter of their own and the vast, stark, frozen desolation itself seemed a more proper monument than statues and stones. The only buildings here were tiny log and mortal cabins, replicas of the army's shelter. Maniac could feel the ache swelling outward from his breast and filling the enormous bounding spaces. He returned to town for the satchel and put himself up in one of the cabins. It was scarcely bigger than a large doghouse. Dog the floor was dirt. There was a doorway, but no door. Several saltines fell from the blanket. He threw them outside, let the birds have them. He wrapped himself in the blanket and lay down. He lay there all night and all the next day. Dreams pursued memories, courted and danced and coupled with them, and they became one in the gaunt, beseeching phantoms that called to him had the rag wrapped feet of Washington's regulars and the faces of his mother and father and Aunt Dad and Uncle Dan and the Beagles, Beetle, Beals and Earl Grayson. In that bedeviled army, there would be no more recruits. No one else would orphan him. The second evening came and went. Maniac never stirred, knowing it would not be fast or easy and wanting, deserving nothing less. Grimly, patiently, he waited for death. Chapter 34. It was during the second night in the cabin that he heard the little voices. They were not soldier voices. I'm going in this one. No, that one. That one's bigger. I'm tired. I'm stopping. You stupid meatball. It's right there. Another two seconds. I'm staying. Great. You beef jerky. Stay. I'm going to that one. Good night. Silence. Then, hold on. I'm coming. That was all. The ghostly soldiers returned, their haunted eyes seeking warmth, food, life. There was no morning, only daylight in the doorway. He pushed himself up, dragged himself outside into the blinding light. The saltines lay in the brown frozen grass. The next cabin was nearby. January slipped an icy finger under his collar and down his back. He pulled the blanket tighter about himself, but it was too late. The finger had touched the last warm coal in his heart, and his body fanning the ember shook itself violently. He walked to the next cabin, 
looked inside and saw a body huddled in the corner. An eye opened, stared at him. Then in succession, three more eyes opened. The body divided and became two, two little boys. Get a load of this meatball, said one with a front tooth missing. He walks around with a blanket on. Hey, meatball, why you bring your mattress along too? And your pillow too, screeched the other. Then missing tooth whipped off his woolen cap and smacked Screecher in the face. Screecher retaliated and Maniac had to step back while a two kid tornado swirl around the cabin. When they finished, they rolled onto their backs, shook their legs at the ceiling and laughed as long as they had fought. The volume coming from Screecher was incredible as though a microphone were embedded in his throat. Finally, Missing Tooth rediscovered the stranger standing in the doorway. Hey, Meatball, you running away too? No, not really, Maniac replied. Well, we are, went Screecher. Where are you going? Maniac asked. The answer came from both, Mexico. Maniac bit back a grin. When they stood, he saw they couldn't have been more than four feet tall or eight years old. Well, he said, it's good and warm down there, but it's pretty far, you know. Yeah, we know, growled Missing Tooth. You think we're meatballs like you? You grabbed a supermarket bag in the corner. Open it. Look. It was filled with candy, cupcakes, pies, even a pack of butterscotch crimbits. Maniac's stomach gasped against itself. He remembered how thirsty he was. Where'd you get all this? We stole it, the screecher blurted. The other smacked him with his cap. Shut up, Piper, you stupid sausage. You don't go telling people you stole stuff. Piper returned the cap slap. You shut up, Russell. I didn't tell him where we stole it. This time the fight was over in less than a minute, but it started up again when Maniac asked where they were from and Piper said, two mills. And Russell said, shut up. He might be a cop and bopped him good. When they settled down, they stared at him. Piper smickered, he ain't no cop, he's a kid. Yeah sneered Russell. That's how much you know. They got cops that look like kids. That's how they catch kids. They stared at him some more. They moved in cautiously, one on either side. They opened his blanket. They patted him all over. What are we doing this for? Piper wanted to know. We're feeling for a gun, Russell explained. Oh, after the padding, they backed off. So, said Russell, you ain't a cop? Not me, said Maniac. He moved in from the down, from the doorway. I'm, and with only a moment's pause, the story came to him. A pizza delivery boy. We have a contest every week, and you two were chosen for a free pizza. The two gapped at each other. We were? Yep, a large. Where is it? demanded Russell, glancing around. At Cobbler's Corner, you have 24 hours to claim your prize. He waited while they bickered over what to do. Volley Forge was a good five or six miles from two mills. These kids might not have made it to Mexico, but they had come a long way and stayed out overnight and someone somewhere must be worried sick about them. And he had a feeling they were kidding about stealing the food. He figured he'd better help them make up their minds. You know, he said, you're taking the long way to Mexico. If you come back to two mills with me, I'll show you a shortcut. That did it. Soon the three of them were trekking past the Washington Memorial Chapel. Russell and Piper with their bag 
maniac with his satchel. It was early afternoon when they walked into Cobbler's Corner at Hector and Birch. Maniac produced his certificate for Cobbler's Knot, and 20 minutes later, the young runaways were tackling a large pizza with pepperoni. Maniac confined himself to three glasses of water and half a dozen crimbits. The two boys agreed with Maniac that they ought to stay the night in their own house before setting out for Mexico in the morning. They were barely a block from cobblers when Maniac heard a familiar voice. Billowing and barreling down the street was the fearsome fastballer, King of the Cobras, Big John McNabb himself, and he was roaring mad. Maniac might have taken off but he found himself clung to and clutched by the two little urchins. They hurled behind him like babies on a possum's back a giant, as Giant John came red-faced and huffing up to them. Where you been, he yelled. As Maniac considered what to say, the urchins peeped from behind him. We wasn't nowhere, John. We was right here with this kid here. And he ain't no cop either. He, we check him out. We checked him out. For the first time, Giant John looked straight at Maniac. A smile crossed his face. Well, well, the frog man. The smile vanished. So what are you doing with my little brothers? Chapter 35. It took a while for everything to get straightened out. First, Giant John had to be convinced that Maniac was not kidnapping his brothers. Then the brothers had to do some more trembling in while John finished lambasting them for running away, which apparently they did about every other week. Then when the brothers found out that their pizza person was none other than the famous maniac Mickey, the very same one who had blasted their big brother's fastballs to smithereens and finished him off with a home run frog. Well, it took a good five minutes of rolling on the sidewalk to get all the laughing out of their systems, which of course got Giant John more than a little steamed. Pompton Maniac, who didn't like seeing John disgraced before his little brothers to say, yeah, but didn't John tell you what happened the next day? And the brothers said, no, what? And Giant John said, huh? And Maniac winked at John and crossed his fingers. Sure, John, you remember, wink, wink. At the Little League field, the next day, you said I was lucky that all you threw me was fastballs because you weren't ready to reveal your secret pitch, the one you'd re you've been working on, remember? Wink, McNabb nodded dumbly. And so I said, well, come on, I can hit anything. Pitch it to me. And you pitched it, and I missed it by a mile. And you kept pitching it to me all day long, and I never even hit a foul ball on it. What was the pitch? What was the pitch? Chanted the urchins. It was, Maniac paused for a dramatic buildup, the stop ball. The stop ball? Yeah, and you should have seen it. It comes right up to the plate, looking all fat and easy to belt. And then, just when you take your swing, Maniac got into his batter's stance and demonstrated, it sort of stops, and your butt just whiffs the air. He whiffed at an imaginary stop ball. Wow, said the brothers, gazing up at their big brother. And so Maniac was invented, invited to accompany the brothers McNabb to their home. Despite the cold, the front door was wide open and Maniac could smell the inside before he could see it. The first thing he did see was a yellow short-haired mongrel looking innocently up at him while taking a leak in the middle of the living room floor. Clean that up, John ordered Russell. Clean that up, Russell ordered Piper. Piper just walked on by. 
After closing the front door, which was surprisingly heavy, Maniac found a stack of newspapers in a corner. He laid some over the puddle to soak it, then gave himself a tour of the downstairs. Maniac had seen some amazing things in his lifetime, but nothing as amazing as that house. From the smell of it, he knew he wasn't the first he knew this wasn't the first time an animal had relieved himself on the rugless floor. In fact, in another corner, he spotted a form of relief that could not be soaked up by newspapers. <laughs> Cans and bottles lay all over, along with crust, peeling, cores, scraps, rinse, wrappers, everything you would normally find in a garbage can. And everywhere there were raisins. And he walked through the dining room, something, an old tennis ball, hit him on top of the head and bounced away. He looked up into the laughing faces of Russell and Piper. The hole in the ceiling was so big, they could have jumped through it at once. He ran a hand along one wall. The peeling paint came off like cornflakes. Nothing could be worse than the living and dining rooms, yet the kitchen was. A jar of peanut butter had crashed to the floor. Someone had gotten a running start, jumped into it, and skied a brown one-footed track to the stove. On the table were what appeared to be the remains of an autopsy performed upon a large bird, possibly a crow. The refrigerator contained two food groups, mustard and beer. The raisins here were even more abundant. He spotted several of them moving. They weren't raisins, they were roaches. The front door opened and seconds later, a man clumped into the kitchen. He wore no winter jacket, only a sleeveless green sweater which ballooned over his enormous stomach. Tattoos blued his upper arms. His hands were nearly pure black. Stale body odor mingled with that of fries and burgers coming from the Burger King bag he held. Dropping the bag next to the bird remains, he bellowed, chow, and took a beer from the fridge. He downed a good half of it in one swig, belched, double clutched, and belched again. He had to know someone besides him, himself, was standing in the kitchen, and just as obviously, he didn't care. Two floor cracking crashes came from the dining room. Geronimo, Geronimo, Russell and Piper had taken the direct route via hole. What'd you bring, Dad? Whoppers? Yeah, whoppers. They tore into the bag just like jackals into carry-on. Plastic flew, fries flew. They both wanted the same whopper. Smashed between their tugging fists, the whopper splurted sauce and cheese and pickle chips. Then it split. Russell lurched backward into the kitchen table with his hat. Piper lurched backward into the opposite direction and with nothing to stop him, sailed right through the ceiling doorway and down the cellar steps. The final thug was, thud was followed by the truck horn blast of Piper's laughter. When Giant John ambled in, the father said, get the blocks. No, grunted John pull it out a pair of whoppers. He tossed one to Maniac. We need more, growled the father. John didn't answer. We need more, I heard. McNabb smashed the tabletop, three fries and a bird wing jumped to the floor. Now, John walked out nonchalantly mun munching. I was busy. The rest of the night was scenes from a loony movie. Scene, McNabb, the father swaggers, bare-armed out the front door, blowing back, 
Do your homework. Scene. Maniac retrieves the wet newspaper from the living room. There are no waste baskets in the house. He finds a trash can in the backyard next to a pile of cinder blocks. He dumps the soggy paper in the can, which is empty. Scene. Small turds of an unfamiliar shape appear here and there along the baseboard of the first floor. Please don't, please don't be rats. Maniac prays. Scene. The cobras come in. They glare at Maniac, but Giant John tells them to lay off. They raid the fridge for beer. They smoke cigarettes. They belch and fart. They curse. Russell and Piper, kitty cobras, pop their own beer cans. Gussle, swagger, belch, smoke, curse. Scene. Football game. From the front of the living room to the back of the dining room except for space it has everything a regular game has running passing blocking tackling kicking there is little furniture to get in the way ordinarily the windows wouldn't last five minutes but the windows of this house are boarded up with plywood body blocked cobras flying to the wall the house flinches. Scene. A faint rustling noise behind the stove. Oh no, rats. Maniac dares to look. It's a turtle. Box turtle munching on old whopper lettuce. Whew. Scene. The boys' bedroom. Russell and P Piper lie prone at the hole. They fire toy submarine guns. Ta-da, 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 ta-da at the cobras heading out the front door. Piper jumps up and blows Maniac away, killing him at least 15 times. This is how we're gonna do it. Bam, bam, bam. The guns be real, says Russell, still prone and firing the stock of the toy gun tight against his cheek. Yeah, squats Piper, real. He flops back to the floor sprays the hole downstairs. Soon, they start coming in. Bam, bam, bam. Who, says Maniac. The enemy, says Russell. Who's that, says Maniac. Russell stops firing long enough to send Maniac a where have you been look. Who do you think, he sneers. He points the red barrel of the submarine gun towards the red room door, towards the east. The east end. The heavy front door. Scene. Darkness. Silence. Sometime every morning, Maniac lies between the two brothers on the bed. Do cockroaches climb bedpost, unable to sleep, asking himself, what am I doing here? Remember Hester and Lester on his lap, Grayson's hug, corn muffin in the toaster oven, thinking, who's the orphan here anyway? Hearing as he at last lowers himself into the sleep's deep waters, a door slam, a slurred voice, do your homework, fearing, will I float? Chapter 36. The deal was, if Russell and Piper went to school for the rest of the week, Maniac would show them the shortcut to Mexico on Saturday. He figured if they all managed to survive till then, he'd come up with something. On Saturday, the boys had their piper, the paper bag packed and Maniac had a new deal. Go to school for another week and he'd treat them for another large pizza. Besides, he said, crossing his fingers, that this was volcano season down in Mexico. The whole place was a sheet of red hot lava. Better wait till it cools down. They bought it and they bought the same deal the following week. The school was still agony for the boys. It had to be worth more than a pizza a week. But what? The brothers thought and thought about it and soon began to realize that the answer was sleeping between them every night. Ever since the famous Maniac McGee had showed up at their house, Russell and Piper McNabb had become famous in their own right. Other kids were always crowding around them, 
pelting them with questions. What's he like? What'd he say? What's he doing? Did he really sit on Finisterwald's front steps? Is he really that fast? Kid started giving them knots, sneaker laces, yo-yo strings, toys, and saying, ask Maniac to undo this, will ya? Really little kids referred to him as Mr. Maniac. The McNabs ate it up. In the streets, the playgrounds, school, detention, not the pizza, was the real reason they put up with school each day. They began to feel something they had never felt before. They began to feel important. What a wonderful thing, this importance, waiting for them. The moment they awoke in the morning, pumping them up like basketballs, giving them bounce, and they hadn't even had to steal it. They loved it. The more they had, the more they wanted. And so, when Maniac tried to cut the pizza, the next pizza for school deal, Russell answered, no. No, echoed Maniac, who had been afraid it would come to this. No, said Russell. We want something else. Oh, said Maniac, what's that? They told him, if he wanted another week's worth of school out of them, he would have to enter Finiswald's backyard and stay there for 10 minutes, screeched Piper, who shuddered at the very thought. When Maniac casually answered, okay, it's a deal. Piper ran screeching from the house. On the next Saturday morning, Russell, Piper, and Maniac set out for Finiswald's house about seven blocks away. They took the alleys along the way they were joined by other kids who were waiting, their eyes at once fearful and excited. By the time they got to Finisterwald's backyard, at least 15 kids huddled against the garage door on the far side of the alley. Maniac didn't hesitate. He walked straight up to the back gate, opened it, and went in. Not only that, he went all the way to the center of the yard, turned, folded his arms, smiled, and called, Who's keeping time? Russell, his throat too dry to speak, raised his hand. For 10 minutes, 15 kids, and possibly the universe, held their breath. The only, sound were, the only sounds were inside their heads, the moaning and wailing of the ghosts of all the poor slobs who had ever plundered onto Finisterwald's property. To the, other, to the utter amazement of all, when Russell finally croaked, time, Maniac McGee was still there, alive, smiling, apparently unharmed. Even more amazing, he didn't come out. Instead, he said, say, you guys, how about adding to the deal? If I do something else while I'm here, will you make it to make it the next two weeks at school? What are you gonna do? Stam stammered Russell. Maniac thought for a moment, then announced brightly, I'll knock on the front door. Five kids finished their wall on the spot. Several others screamed, no, don't. Piper went into some sort of fit and began kicking the garage door. Russell zoned out. Maniac took all of this to signify a deal. He hopped the backyard fence and strolled around front. The others went back down the alley and around the long way. They stationed themselves not only across the street, but almost halfway up the block. And even then, they squeezed together in a bunch as though if they allowed any space between them. Finister Wall might somehow pick them off one by one. They're hurtled, trembling to bear witness to the last seconds of Maniac McGee's life. They saw him stand directly in front of the red brick, three-story house, the bile green window shades they saw him climb the three 
cement steps to the white door, the portal of death. They saw him raise his hand, and though they were too far away to hear, they saw him knock upon the door, and 15 hearts beat in time to that silent knocking. The door opened. Finister walls, door open. Not much, but enough so the witnesses could make out a thin strip of blackness. Would Maniac be sucked into that black hole like so much lint into a vacuum cleaner? Would Finister Wald's long bony hand dart out quick as a lizard's tongue and snatch poor Maniac? Maniac appeared to be speaking to the dark crack. Was he pleading for his life? Would this last with, would his last words be skewered like a marshmallow by Finister Wald's dagger tipped cane? Apparently not. The door closed. Maniac bounded down the steps and came jogging towards them, toward them, grinning. Three kids bolted. Sure, he was a ghost. The others stayed. They invented excuses to touch him to see if he was still himself, still warm, but they weren't positively certain until later when they watched him devour a pack of butterscotch crimbits. So that was really interesting. Um, so that is the end of chapter 36. We are almost towards the end of the book. I hope as I am reading, you are able to visualize a lot of the story in your own mind, creating a movie in your own mind. And that's what good readers do. You visualize what the characters look like, what the scene looks like, how they're acting, all based on the description that the author gives us. And Jerry Spinelli does such a wonderful job describing um Everything, his descriptive writing is so on point. And I hope you're really enjoying it because I'm truly enjoying it, enjoying reading it for you. So, or reading it to you. So I hope uh, to see you tomorrow for the next few chapters of Maniac McGee. Have a good night for now.